Uh, welcome everyone to Blainsburg Bible Church, and as usual, just before the camera comes on, somebody says something funny to get me laughing, <laughs> so, <laughs> and that would be my nephew David, so thank you for all being here, thank you all of you for being here tonight, those who are present with us here at Blainsburg Bible Church, and those of you who are watching by live stream, uh, Pastor Frank is actually doing some mission work tonight, he's uh, on a mission to lead a person to the Lord, and so just uh, keep him in your prayers that the Holy Spirit will continue to mightily use him in this manner uh, so that um, this person just surrenders their life to Jesus, because that is the most critical thing in life, uh, because this life is temporary, but the one to come is eternal, and we're either going to spend our time of eternity in the presence of God where we know that uh, if we go by way of Jesus, who is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, if we go by way of him and put our faith in him, then that day that we stand before God, we'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And if we decide to go by any other way, because Jesus said, what did he say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So if we decide to go in by any other way, then what's going to be said? Depart from me. I don't know you. And that uh, then those go into everlasting punishment. And I know there's not a lot of hellfire and brimstone preaching that seems to be going on lately, but uh, the truth of the matter does not change, is that there's uh, two ways. That's when we die, we either stand before the Lord and are acceptable uh, to him by what Christ has done for us on the cross and our faith in what Christ has done for us on the cross, or we are banned from the presence of God throughout all eternity into a place of punishment. Actually, hell was actually, what the Bible tells us, was a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And the, what's the end state of hell itself? It gets put where? Revelation, where? Lake of fire. Lake of fire. Death and hell itself gets cast in to the lake of fire. So, uh, Pastor Frank was going to continue uh, on the lesson that uh, he had prepared. I think there was four segments for it, and so this is the second week of uh, him uh, not being here due to circumstances beyond our control, but actually it's a, it's a good thing of what he's actually doing right now. So, um, I just uh, had something on my heart. It was actually something that uh, I was speaking to Pastor Frank yesterday as in... Uh, uh, application for really for uh, uh, somebody that uh, he knows and that's uh, it just the more I was thinking about it I thought just how applicable it is for us uh, here tonight so who wants to open in prayer not Joe <laughs> Joe's eating some popcorn right now <laughs> oh you guys make me laugh <laughs> So he's washing it down now. That's you know anybody else? I'm, everybody's chewing, you know. <laughs> okay, it's going to be Joe, I guess. Dear Heavenly, purple. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, God, that we have a place to come and fellowship together, Lord God, God, and to hear your word, to hear your truth, Father God, God, we ask as it as it comes out to our ears, Lord God, God, that we receive it, Father God. God, and we apply it to our hearts and our minds, Lord God. God, and we walk out of here and using what you've given us. God, we just thank you, Lord God, that you give us the opportunity to know you. God, that at any time that we accept you, Lord God, as our Savior, Father God, God, that we are saved and we know that, Lord God, and we just thank you. God, we just ask that the the hand of comfort and, and protection be over Sister Rosie, Lord God. Yes. God, and, and the ones that are, are dealing with illnesses and, and sadness right now, Father God. God, just allow the spirit of comfort to go over top of them, Lord God. The spirit of peace to fall upon them, Lord God. God, we just thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody is an old man today. Um, they just... Became an adult, for better or worse. That's that long-haired fella over there. Well, the dark-haired, long-haired fella 
over there, Mr. Stephen. Can we get a camera on Mr. Stephen? Mr. Stephen Smith. No, we can't put that picture on live stream. Did you already do it by accident? I'm not an idiot, you know. That's, I know what you guys are always up to something, especially now that Steve, actually you should have done this before Steven's 18 because now we can, uh, we, we, we can't just whoop him now, we'll just have to throw him in jail. <laughs> Mr. Steven, okay, switch to camera two. Oh, you don't have to say anything. Hi. Hi. He's 18 years old today, and we just want to celebrate his birthday with him. Who's going to, who we're all going to sing to him. How's that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Stephen. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> He don't get embarrassed. Actually, he's not blushing. He actually turns a, even more of a pasty white than what he already is. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, yes, I'm allowed to make fun of those kids. I put up with them for a year, year so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Hey, uh, I, I'm hearing a ring, brother. You can go... You can go ahead and adjust that EQ because I saved the, the right one. I saved a copy of it. Yes. So um, just make sure it's loud enough for everyone to hear. And uh, the other mics as well. We're uh, doing some housekeeping here, folks. Uh, tonight, uh, I would like to actually talk about a topic that uh, is important for everyone to actually hear, know, understand, and apply uh, to their lives, and uh, I don't know what it would actually take to get uh, everyone to listen, even through the, the, the dry times of um, lessons, you know, that's because there's, um, you know, sometimes, I was listening to a story today, and the guy was, uh, he was going to explain a very, um, um, what would normally be a difficult to understand topic, but there was like a really cool side of it too, but he used an example saying, like, he said that, uh, when, when I would have dinner as a kid, we had to eat everything that was on our plate, and we uh, had to eat the vegetables, even though we didn't like the vegetables. With the, and, and then sometimes, he said, Mom would serve broccoli, and he didn't like broccoli. Yeah, some people love broccoli, some people don't. And uh, what, President Bush actually got in trouble for saying that he didn't like broccoli. You remember that? Because he was like, oh, how could you say that as a president? Now the kids aren't going to eat broccoli. But anyway, he said sometimes mom would put broccoli on the plate. So what he did was that he would eat the broccoli first so he could enjoy the rest of the meal, the stuff that he really did like to eat. So that's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's complicated things uh, sometimes. And uh, sometimes you got to digest or, or like uh, take in the broccoli first before you get to the real exciting thing. So that's the way it is in any sort of, of lesson. You know, it, it all can't be um, like, it all can't be entertaining. It all can't be, um, you know, just fine anecdotal stories and testimonies and all this other stuff. Sometimes you have to actually take things and, um, and 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 learn them, you know. Just like like if um, like Joe said that he might want to learn how to uh, uh, play the guitar. He, he seems to, you know he has an interest in that. So what's what's the first step for Joe in learning how to play a guitar? Get a guitar, <laughs> get a guitar, and then you know putting put in the time, uh, you know get, developing calluses on your fingers, and then. You know, learning the the notes, um, like the, the the you know the open strings. You know what the tuning of it is and what that means, and you know just a little bit maybe of music theory. David, how many hours did you put in before you could play the guitar well? Uh, it's not helpful. 1500 About fifteen hundred hours, because I remember when he first moved up here, I asked him because he I remember when he couldn't play a chord on um, on the guitar. He couldn't even really hold a guitar. And uh, you had, I think, at that time, 497 hours in. And then over the past uh, few years now, I mean, anytime you pull up to his grandma's house, uh, David lives uh, out in the, it's an attached garage, but it's been converted to a living space. 
and you roll up to those uh, sliding doors and you you hear him in there. That's just all. Yeah, is that what it sounds like too? <laughs> and then if it's not the guitar, it's the banjo. If it's not the banjo, it's the mandolin. But uh, fortunately, I I don't get. Yeah, he does the bass too. And uh, he was really actually rocking the bass on Sunday there because I was listening back on the live stream and. Uh, at least the bass was adjusted uh, through the live stream volume good enough that you could hear it well. And I was like, wow, he's doing some pretty cool runs on there. So he puts a lot of hours in uh, to learn something. And then there's other things that he has absolutely no interest in learning. And it's like pulling teeth to get him to pay attention uh, in order to absorb some information from the stuff that's necessary, but even though he doesn't have interest in it. So if we could keep everybody uh, awake tonight, you know, there's caffeine that's available over there. And don't eat too many sugary snacks because that may give you just a short bolt of energy, but then you'll get tired shortly afterwards. So tonight we're going to be talking about work the problem. Anybody ever hear that saying before, work the problem? That's, uh, it actually uh, became uh, popular in, uh, in, in modern uh, culture. Hey, Rosie. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. You okay? No, you're not interrupting. We're glad you're here. Glad you're here. Working the problem. There's a fellow named Gene Krantz. Uh, he's an aerospace engineer. He's actually still alive at 88 years of age. And uh, he was a flight director for NASA all the way up to the Apollo 17 mission. And he was a flight director during the Apollo 13 mission that was made into a major movie. Uh, Tom Hanks and a few other fellas. If you remember, there was an explosion during the flight and the crew was at risk of perishing. And uh, the crew in space and the team on Earth, they worked together. Uh, they worked the problem together to get the crew back home. And Gene Kranz is uh, said to have repeated the phrase when he was a flight director to work the problem after every obstacle that uh, the crew and the team on Earth was facing. Now, Gene Krantz, K-R-A-N-Z. And it was actor Ed Harris who played Gene in the movie Apollo 13. And uh, excuse me for one moment. Oh, okay. It was actually uh, Ed Harris who played uh, Gene in the movie. And he said, uh, Ed Harris said, let's work the problem, people. Let's not make things work worse by guessing. Uh, the saying must have been... Uh, must have made it into popular culture, as it was also a quote that was used during a television show called Seal Team, where this fellow named David Boreanaz, uh, he speaks the line, work the problem, Ray. Uh, it was during a scene where his teammate named Ray, uh, Ray had a failed uh, shoot deployment during what's called a halo uh, parachute jump. Uh, a halo is, um, there's a uh, it's high altitude, low opening. It's a parachute jump out of an airplane, obviously. That's, uh, that's when a person actually jumps from a height that is about uh, 36,000 feet. They can go up to about 36,000 feet. And uh, then when they do jump out of the plane, they have to have oxygen supplementation. They're jumping out with their full gear. And they free fall for almost a minute and a half, almost uh, 90 seconds before they actually open their chute. And the speed of their descent is roughly around 126 miles per hour. And uh, that's because it's a thing called terminal velocity. And real military operators do this crazy stuff all the time. And it's, um, they do it for a living. So when the character Ray in this uh, TV show, when his chute uh, opened, he got tangled in the lines. It was a failed uh, deployment of the chute. And actor David Boreanaz, who portrays the character Jason Hayes, he spoke uh, his line that told Ray to work the problem. He's told him this in this fictitious account. Uh, in this fictitious account, we have a man that's falling at 126 miles per hour. It's in the nighttime, and it's over a country where they're not even allowed to be. And he is tangled in his parachute lines. And his friend and leader, for a long time, he tells him, he says, Ray, work the problem, Ray. Now you, with the things that you're facing in your life, uh, you may feel like you're falling near terminal, veloc terminal velocity. Sorry for the mess up there. 
And uh, like I said, uh, terminal velocity, that's when you're free falling through the air close to the maximum speed that a human body can fall based on its weight and position and the aerodynamics that your of your body. And uh, like those, some of those birds can, uh, some falcons can dive at 200 miles an hour and uh, that's their terminal velocity. That's as fast as they can go uh, because of the air resistance and stuff like that. So um, Ray was falling through that night sky at about 126 thousand miles per hour, 126 miles per hour, rather, and uh, his friend tells him, he says, uh, work the problem, Ray. So for us in our own, uh, our very own lives that do, sometimes we feel, uh, due to the situations that we're facing, that we feel like we're free-falling through the air close to that maximum speed, that terminal velocity. <clears throat> the problems that um, you are facing, they may have you feel like you are... Um, just like, you know, you're, you're falling so fast that you can't go any faster. In other words, that it can't get any more worse than what it already is. It's bad, and it's, it's real bad, and you can't imagine that it can get any worse, that it can't get any badder, so to speak, and then you get to the point that you don't know what to do. Now, just for a quick note, I'm not telling anyone that it's okay to watch, you know, the movie Apollo 13 or the TV show uh, SEAL Team. I just... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I was familiar with the term, uh, that little saying there about work the problem, and I needed a couple of examples to show how it was used in order to make the point in tonight's lesson. Now, like the real astronauts of Apollo 13 or those who serve in the real Navy as team members, you are going to face problems. That, that's it. That's, uh, there's um, military operators. They face problems every day. There's, um, there's astronauts that uh, that's, they're, they're still, um, we still have astronauts, even though our, our space program is uh, a little questionable right now, but they, they, they face problems every day. And for military operators and even those in um, our space administration, some of the problems uh, are life or death situations that they face because we have, uh, you know, they're still testing aircraft and stuff like that. And uh, there's still, um, you know, pilots uh, flying at, uh, you know, incredible speeds. And then there's breakdowns of the aircraft and stuff like that. And in order for them to protect their own lives in these life or death situations, they have to work the problem. And so it's um, in your own life, you're going to face problems. In all of our lives, we're going to face problems. Some of the problems are incredibly serious problems. Some of the problems are things like they, th they seem like uh, it's just like we've fallen into quicksand and we're not going to get out. Some of the problems are problems that uh, uh, make us think uh, like, you know, how can I go on? You know, how can I continue because I'm facing such a serious problem? And, uh, you know, to us on a personal level, they do become life or death situation types of problems. And, um, for us, as we face these problems, it's what we do that defines us as individuals. And it's a good thing that for us believers, that even though our response to our problems defines us, even though our responses to our problems, they do define us, how we work the problems in our lives, it's, it's nice, it's, it's beautiful, it's incredible that we have an advocate with the Father, that's Jesus Christ the righteous, who can rewrite a bad definition when we repent of things that we've done wrong. So even if we've been trying to work the problem and we, whatever it may be, and we didn't work it the right way and we messed up, we made a mistake, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who can rewrite any bad de definition that we've given of ourselves because we haven't uh, been working our problems the right way. Now, I was paraphrasing 1 John 2, verse 1, but it's important to, when you have the time on your own to read that through to verse 6. Now, number one, like the military operators, uh, you have a real enemy that wants to kill you. That's an important uh, thing to understand about uh, in your own life if you're going to be able to work the problems that you do have. If, you, if you're trying to figure out in your own life, in a situation that, you're, that you find yourself in, no matter how, really, how minor it is or how critically serious that you find it, um, because um, this, 
there are devastating things that can happen to us as human beings. And um, we have um, many examples in the Bible of truly devastating things that did happen to people. And those things that were written were written as examples to us as uh, not only what we shouldn't do in many situations, uh, because we have the examples. Like for the example, um, in the Old Testament, uh, there was a whole lot of bad kings uh, that came out of Judah and uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. But there, there was very few uh, actual uh, good kings. And so they, they set the example with the bad kings, like, hey, this is stuff you shouldn't do. And then with the example, the few examples that we have of the good kings, they set examples of things, you know, how we should respond to certain situations. But for us, the first thing to know uh, as we work the problem uh, in our life, whatever it may be, no matter how serious it happens to be, that like the military operators, you have a real enemy that wants to kill you. Your accuser, Satan, he actually goes before God trying to raise a case against you, and he's hurling accusations all the time, uh, things like, you will fail if this happens to you, or if that happens to you, that you're going to give up, you're going to quit, and uh, he rails against you to God telling him that when the going gets tough, that you will not only turn your back on God's way of doing things, but you will actually end up cursing God as well. And this biblical teaching is actually demonstrated to us in the book of Job, starting right at the beginning in chapter 1. Uh, and when you read in the book of Job, uh, we see at the first off there that uh, Job was a righteous and he was an upright man, right? If you've re ever read the book of Job. And then we see that um, there was um, God... And the, the sons of God, like that, the angels and stuff, and then it said that Satan came and appeared uh, in their presence as well. And uh, God said to Satan, the accuser, Satan in Hebrew, um, it's actually Satan. And uh, it always is uh, prefaced by ha, which is in Hebrew, the letter, which is Hebrew, the word the. So anytime you see Satan, when it's translated in English, it actually should say the Satan because, you know, we call that to him like it's a, a personal name to him, like Fred or something like that. And it's, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a title uh, of, uh, of what he is, that he is the accuser. Satan is uh, accuser. Ha is the. And when you read it in the original Hebrew, it says, you know, ha Satan, the accuser. So we see it as Satan, and then they capitalize it, and we kind of recognize it as a proper noun, like it's a name of him. But this creature is so fallen that we don't even really know what his name was. Because uh, just as an aside, in Isaiah, when it refers to uh, does that dual uh, explanation you're talking about, probably Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Satan there, where um, uh, uh, the prophet was saying, like, you said that you're going to ascend above the Most High, that I will do this, I will do that. It's like the five uh, I wills of Satan. And, but it says, but no, you're going to be cast down to the pit. Uh, that's, it mentions Lucifer in there and say, oh, okay, well, Lucifer must have been Satan's name when he was an angel in heaven. No, that's actually just a word that became kind of Latinized and then was translated over into English. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not a proper name. So I just want to say that because I don't want to give this, I don't want to give the devil any more credit than what uh, he's due, but he's fallen so far. Jesus said, I beheld Satan, the accuser, Hasatan, when he fell from heaven as lightning. And that's when Jesus said, because it was the 70 coming back, and he said, hey, wow, Lord, even the devils are subject to unto, unto us. And Jesus said, like, oh, I've seen Satan cast from heaven like lightning. So, you know, don't, don't marvel that the devils are subject unto you. You want to you wanna be impressed about something? Be impressed that your names are written in the book of life. That's what Jesus told him. So this creature that uh, he doesn't even have a name as far as a proper name. In Revelation, we see him referred to as the great dragon. We see him referred to as Apollyon. We see him referred to as Abaddon, you know, Abaddon, Apollyon. And, but he, he doesn't have a name. I just want to show you like how far that he has fallen from the, the, the grace of being able to be in the presence of God and be part of the, the holy angels that we don't even, as human beings, know what his actual name uh, was what it was given to him by God. So this creature 
he, we see him in Job that he does appear before God and he's railing accusations uh, about Job saying like, you know, if, if this, this Job fella, he serves you because you got a fence around him, you know, and it says hedge in the King James English, you got a, you got a fence all the way around him and I can't get to him, but I'll tell you what, God, if you let me get to him in, in, in any way whatsoever, then not only will he um, turn his back on you, he'll curse you to your face. And then that's, um, God said, like, you know, you can touch anything he has, but you can't touch his life. And um, it's one of the hardest things for us as Christians to see how this was actually an honor coming from God. I mean, that's, you know, to be put to the proof like that, that's an honor from God. That's because God knew the heart of his servant, Job. Does everybody on earth have to suffer like Job did in order to be able to, um, you know, be the person that God wants them to be? No. You know, we, when we, I think, what is it, Hebrews 13, it talks about how, um, there was those who that they, they had their their sons uh, restored to life and all the good things and that. But then there's the other side of the coin. It says there was others that uh, for a greater glory, you know, they were sawn in half and stuff like that. There's there's always like two sides to the coin, and we um, not everyone has to suffer in those uh, to that extreme that Job did. But can is there anybody in this room or even by live stream that might be able to put into the comments? that could say that, uh, you know, I have never suffered at all in any way, shape, or form. Even when you know somebody closely, you really can't imagine what they've been through through their own perspective. You know, sometimes we can look at another person and we can say, like, I know the stuff you've been through. I could deal with that. Maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. But what they've went through and how they've experienced it, you know, things you know, can be very traumatic in a person's life, even though for maybe you as an individual, you could take some things you know, very lightly. But in your own life, there's things that happened and um, they were traumatic to you, and maybe somebody else, you know, they are of the build, so to speak, where the things that you faced in your own life would be uh, what be considered, you know, a lot of a lighter burden to them compared to what they've been through. So <clears throat> when we look at another person and we want to, um, like, give them a prejudgment, like, you know, like, just to uh, put a label on them, uh, to let me put it this way, put a, a, a negative or derogatory label on them, uh, we should uh, consider what we've been through first. Like, just, just think about it. You know, I've been through this, I've been through that, I've been through something else, and, uh, you know, for these things that I've been through and some of the behaviors that I'm still working on because of some of the stuff I've been through, I really wouldn't want them putting a label on me saying that I'm this because of, you know, maybe some of the attitudes that I carry over from some of the stuff that, you know, I've been through. So what I'm going to do when I look at them is that I'm going to extend to them mercy and grace like Christ extended to me, and I'm going to be patient with them, and I'm not going to label them, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be appreciative, and I'm going to be a little bit sympathetic, I'm going to be a little bit empathetic where I can for what other people have uh, gone through. So, um, we don't all have to actually suffer like Job did, but uh, there's sometimes that we go through things in our lives, and it, um, if we happen to be reading in the book of Job at that particular time that we're going through something very bad in our life, we might uh, say that, uh, you know, I, you know I, can, I can really relate to Job right now, you know, even though this didn't happen to me or that didn't happen to me, I can imagine some of the pain that he felt because I know what I'm feeling right now for what I'm going through. And that's, you know, we can, that's, that's empathy when it's like, you know, I've been through something terrible and so I can really feel 
for what, uh, what Job has, uh, has had gone through. So we see that right away in the book of Job in chapter 1, that the devil's there railing these accusations against them. But here's the interesting thing, is that Job had no clue about what was actually going on in the heavenly realm. We see that because we're reading it from the perspective of being like taken up above the whole scene. Like, you know, we're, we're pulled back from the scene. We see Job, and we also see the, what's going on in the spiritual realm of things. And then we, but Job, he didn't have that privilege. The only thing Job knew was that his life was falling apart, and he lost everything. He lost all of his children. He lost his sons and daughters. He lost uh, all of his property. He lost all of his wealth. He was very wealthy in livestock and things, and he lost his health. And um, he was estranged from even his own uh, wife. She was alive, but uh, in part of Job, it says that, you know, my breath is strange unto my wife, that, that you know, there was no um, uh, intimacy between them anymore. They were separated in that w- way. And this man that was wealthy, you know, think of a very wealthy person in, the, in this world right now. He ended up uh, on the, the ash heap at the, the, in, in, at the dump, the town dump, and he was taking uh, pieces of property, and he was scraping his flesh because of the boils that were on his skin. This guy, and all this stuff happened um, within just a, I think it was just in a matter of, what, 72 hours? It was just in a couple of days or something like that. I don't remember the actual time frame, but all this stuff happened quickly uh, on Job. And then, um, then, then it went from bad to worse. His friend showed up, and then they accused him of being the guilty party that brought all this on himself. So, you know, Job was in a bad way there. So, though Job personally answered such terrible accusations against himself that the devil accused him of, and Job eventually prevailed over these things, not every believer in God truly turns things over to God. In the Bible, it says in James 1, verses 2 through 5, uh, we actually learn that uh, We are not only going to be put to the proof, the test, uh, but that we should be cheerful when it happens. What? You know, we're supposed to be cheerful when we're tested like Job was? Uh, uh, Job wasn't very cheerful. Uh, It says in the Bible that through all these things that Job never cursed God. But sometimes we forget that Job actually accused God a lot in that book, but he never cursed him. He accused God of being, you know, not fair. He didn't know what he was doing running the universe because it wasn't fair. And then uh, what did God do? Did he answer every one of Job's questions? No. He showed him. He says, Job, this is what I do. And it is so complicated, Job, that you're not even, you don't even have the mental capacity as a human being to understand it. But I'm going to demonstrate some of it to you. And so he showed him some of the stuff, and he says that as a human being, you're incapable of even understanding the things that I do to hold this universe together. And, um, but he didn't give him an answer as why he was accused in that manner and why uh, that, uh, that was the only interaction that he had with God was to see that, hey, Job, you accused me of being unfair. Let me show you what I actually do for a living, so to speak, God says. And he uh, demonstrated things to Job that was like, this is what it takes to, to operate the universe. And, um, <clears throat> but he didn't actually give a Job an answer as to like, this is why you had to go through this. Job in his life here, even though we saw uh, the spiritual side of things, Job didn't. And it's, that was actually a privilege for us in order for us to understand that there's actually spiritual things that are involved in our own physical lives here that go way beyond our capability to understand, but they do tie up with what Romans 8.28 says, and we'll get to that later. And what does Romans 8.28 say? Can you grab a mic, sister? Somebody give an uh, orange mic. And I'll take a drink here and cough for a second. For all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Amen. For all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. But that's when we're facing things. 
when we're working the problem, when we're in the, the depths of uh, the, own, the, the very things that um, give us terrible fear, um, where we think that we're not going to be able to breathe and survive the situation, when we're in the, the throes of that, it's hard to imagine that God's going to work something together for good. But if we have the patience to live it out and to actually trust in Him, we will see His glory manifest in our lives. But not, um, not everyone that um, calls himself a believer in God truly turns things over to Him. So when we're put to the proof, when we're put to the test, we're supposed to actually do it in a cheerful way. And I'm thinking, like, how in the world can we do that? In James chapter uh, 1, verses 2 through 5, it says, My brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Be cheerful. When you fall into diverse temptations, we'll look at that word temptations in just a moment. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And we actually mentioned this verse last week. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. He doesn't rebuke you for asking for wisdom, and it shall be given him. That word temptation is there. My brethren, count it all joy when you find yourself falling into diverse uh, temptations. Temptations is uh, <clears throat> it's a Greek word. It's actually, uh, it's kind of pronounced like uh, parasmos, parasmos. And um, what it means is uh, putting to the proof or uh, a testing. It's an experiment, putting to the proof. It's a testing of something. So when you find, find yourself in diverse or like myriad of, or like, um, like, a, like a mix of uh, being put to the proof, put to the test, be cheerful about it. Be, be joyful. And how in the world can we be joyful when we're being put to the test to see uh, when our faith is being put to the test? Sister Chris? Calmly well. Joy, calmly well. Yeah, that... They can't hear you on live stream. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Ah. <laughs> um, Would actually, you repeat what you said about the definition? Means, the joy means calm, uh, calmly well. And it doesn't mean like you're so excited and happy that you're going through something. But that, that type of joy means that you have the peace of God beyond understanding within you, knowing that no matter what's going on on the outside of you, that God is in control and he's going to get you through, through that. Amen. Amen. That's um, calmly well. I like that. Let's switch back to camera one. Did you want to hand me something? Oh, okay. Yeah. Rosie. She, you know when you was talking about fair? Mm hmm Talking about fair? Mm hmm I was telling that to God. Because I was going, this is so unfair for me. For me to be by myself. And then, and then my husband passes away. I said, this is so unfair. I said, you, you, we were supposed to be together for a long time. Yes. And I said, and that's just so unfair. But I just kept saying it because he, was, he brought him to me. And he was supposed to be with me. And now he's gone. Yeah, that's why we, I was kind of surprised when you come in tonight. For those of you who are watching by live stream, um, I was talking before we actually uh, brought the system live that uh, Rosie's husband, George, who we have been praying for for a long time, he's been in the hospital since December 22nd, yeah. December 21st, December 21st, um, that uh, George passed away uh, today after a long, long battle with the complications of COVID, just progressing from one thing uh, to the next. And uh, he passed away today in uh, Pittsburgh. Was it Pittsburgh or where was in he at? West Virginia. West Virginia, down by Ruby. Well, okay, yeah. okay. I well, thought they brought him back here. General. And so that's uh, what Rosie is facing today. And, uh, you know, tonight I felt that we should talk about this, about 
uh, work the problem, and this definitely applies. So go ahead and continue, sister. Well, I just was telling God I need him here. You know, but he told me in Pittsburgh months ago, he said, I'm not making it out of here. And I said, why would you say that? I said, don't you want to be with me? Don't you want to be home with me? And he went, but I was, you know, thinking that he was thinking about God. Because mm -hmm. you know why? He told me that he was flying through heaven. And he, and he had his arms out like this, flying. And, and he said, I saw God, I saw heaven, and I saw a big, beautiful church. And I told him, I said, don't, don't talk, because he had the trach in his neck. Yeah, yeah. I said, don't talk. Tube feeding, tracheotomy. Um, yeah, and then he was on kidney dialysis. Dialysis. This thing took him down, like knocked him out. And I was so mad. It just knocked him out. And I was so mad. And, and then I just said, you know, to him, I said, don't say that. I said, don't you want to come home? And then he goes just like this. And then he told me he was flying through heaven. I said, write down what you want to say to me. Mm -hmm. So he wrote down on the board because I br brought a board in there for him to write in case he couldn't talk. Right. But he can use his hands. Mm -hmm. So he, he wrote down, I was flying through heaven. And he was going, beautiful, beautiful heaven. I saw God. I saw a big church, and he said, and I was just flying. And I kept flying and flying through heaven, and I know he was there because whenever I came downstairs one morning, I just happened to turn from my stairs to go into my kitchen. I stopped, and I said, he's in here with me. He was there. The spirit was there. And I believe they told him, go back to your body because you are not time yet to go. And that's what I believe. And I just believe that God was preparing me all these months because he was gone for these, this thing to happen. <clears throat> that very well could be. And you know, every night I would go to bed and I would just pray and ask the Lord to bring him back to me. That's what we were praying, too, for him to be able to come home to you. Yes, and I was praying that so hard and so much that I, I got wore out. I actually got wore out from, you know, saying, bring him home to me, Lord. Right. I said, That's, I, you know, you can, I said, you raised Lazarus from the dead. I said, you called him out of the grave. I said, why can't you call, why can't you call my husband out? I said, my husband's just laying right there. I said, call him out. Make him sit up. Make him you know, open up his eyes, make him eat, make him do this. Make mm -hmm. him. I just was constantly saying stuff like that. And the Lord probably said, oh, shut up, Rosie. What are you doing? No. <laughs> no, he, um. And he, and I was laying, you know, and he said, I was laying in bed the other night and I was trying to listen to his voice because sometimes I hear God's voice. Okay, because one day he said, he asked me if I was going to go to church, and I said, yeah, I'm going to go to church, you know, like that. And he said, when? And I said, I don't know when. And he said, why? And I said, I don't know why. And there was no answer after that. But, um, but I just was constantly praying for him. He got a better life now because he's on the other side, you know, and one day, you know, one time I could feel like I'm so happy that he's there. And the next time it's like I can cry that he's well, that's gone the natural, away from me. That's the natural thing of, of grief. That's like a, it's going to be like a, a roller coaster ride, you know, as a, unless you know, the Lord gives you that peace from him that does pass all understanding. Keep your heart and mind in, in Jesus. That's... Um, you know, so that's uh, you, what you're describing is just naturally, um, you know, what we would be going through as a believer in Christ that, you know, you're happy that, um, you know, eternally to, for them to be the person to be present with the Lord. Um, but then how can you not miss him and then begin to cry uh, to weep over your own personal loss? I mean, that's uh, that's why, you know, I mean, it's we were surprised really to see you 
here tonight, and I'm glad that you are here amongst us tonight because we want to do whatever we can, you know, whatever we can to help uh, support you through this. And, you know, that's, um, as you, um, some, you know, sometimes we stumble our way through grief, and as you stumble your way through grief, we'll be stumbling our way through trying to help you through it. But yeah, I can under, I can, I mean, how can you not miss him? But then on the other hand, you know, to be happy uh, because you said you know that he's actually in the presence of the Lord, so. Yeah, and I just, you know, I just kept on praying for him to come back. I mean, maybe the Lord didn't want him to come back. Maybe, you know, because I was going, but it's your will, Lord, not my will. That, that's I kept some, saying that, too. And that was helping me out, too, when well, I was saying good. that. You know, because and then I was, you know, quoting scriptures and everything like that. And um, it's just, I know everybody tells me they know what I'm going through. No. You know, because people went through the same thing. Yeah, but it's, you know? this is unique to you. As we can empathize with uh, the, the, the grief over loss through death, but um, to know exactly what you're feeling personally, no. no you know, none of us can know that. That we yeah. can, you know, we can you know, just, um, you know, some folks uh, have not had a loss like that. You know, maybe they've lost like a mother or father or something like that. And then um, it's, it's, it's grief, but it's a, it's a little different. So what you're going through, um, even though, you know, billions upon billions of people went through it before, what you're going through is unique to you. So that's... Um, but I'm going to be okay. Yes, yes, you are. I'm going to be we okay. know that. We know that, but we, um, you know, we want you to be certain, certain of it too, and to experience that that you are going to be okay. Because uh, I know when this first happened, mm. when George was confined to the hospital, that um, you know you probably wondered like, how are you going to make it on your own? You had to go ahead and take over all the bills. And everything like that, and you told me you discovered about you know things that needed to be paid and things like that, and stuff you had to like you know get on right away uh, because you said that he handled all that. But now you've had several months of experience demonstrating to yourself that through those things that you you can make it on your own with yeah that. joy. Well, no, there's I wouldn't say there's joy in it, but <laughs> you did it. Well, I you did it. Well, I didn't mean that for the last. I mean, I didn't mean that seriously, joy. But you, you did I it, right? Joy. That's a, I'm not meaning that to be fun. I mean, oh, okay. I mean, you know, like serious. But you, um, you made it through all that, and that's um, so. That's um, you do have the, the proof that, um, you know, that as far as your own well-being, you can make it that way on your own. But now uh, you do have that that great loss. And now you're, you know, it's like um, you're navigating into uncharted waters. You've never been there before, so. I was going to have a block party when he came home. Yeah. I was. Well, I that's. Was planning a block. Well, a that would have been a big thing. Yeah. I was. I was planning the block. Yeah, because he, party. he I really. Gonna, I mean, he was gone for months in the hospital, so. And I was saying, you know, um, when he comes through the the door that you're going to see the glory of the Lord coming in and that's what the Lord did for my my husband mm -hmm. made him well but he had other plans he had other plans for him yes now I can sit here and I can say straight face to you just like this and who knows I'm going to be crying later yep that's natural sister that's a natural natural response don't be surprised I call you two in the morning <laughs> Oh, Pastor, I, I miss my husband, though. <laughs> we know you do. We are glad that you're here, though. I got everybody's phone number, so look out. <laughs> yeah, don't. That's. Uh, them tonight. You're actually. <laughs> you're actually uh, doing something that. Yeah, you're doing something that other people on. would. Some folks would find impossible to do. Because what's the first thing you want to do in grief? You want to isolate yourself. You want to isolate yourself, separate yourself. You want to try to process it in your own mind. And then, uh, you know, you're, you, you get concerned about uh, the public dis display of emotion. Like, you know, I don't want to be 
crying in front of people. I don't want to do this. So uh, what you're doing right now, uh, uh, some other folks would find it uh, impossible to do. So, I mean, that's a testimony in and of itself right there. And uh, we do pray that uh, you receive just complete peace over this because I know uh, that God can give you that kind of peace. But um, like you said, you know, you, you're happy for him that uh, he's now delivered from the sickness, the pain, and just laying in a hospital bed day after day. You're happy for that. But then there's, the, there's that, that feeling within you about the loss. And that's, you said you can cry one minute and then be happy for him the next. That's, that's 100% natural. That's to be expected. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to do what we can to support you through this. You know, are we going to make mistakes? Yeah. But we're going to do our best to help you through this time. And so that's, um, you know, you know, just you'll find people that you can rely on well, other people that you can have some conversations with, get a little bit out of. And but uh, like you said, you'll be all right. It yeah. seems that you've already determined that in your heart to be all right. So that's a wonderful thing, actually. Yeah, I just, you know. I've just been going over this in my mind since December 21st. December 21st. And, um, and, and I thought he was going to make it out of there. But he, when he told me that in Pittsburgh, I just, he said, no, I'm not going to make it out of here. So I think he knew. Uh, it sounds like he did. I mean, why would he say it? I know with some of the things you described to me, it was a very critical illness, and uh, at any point along the way, any of those things could have ended his life. You know, the, I mean, the um, septicemia, he had the septic shock. Well, he got that over, he got over that. Yeah, and then, um, the, you know, the, the... The pneumonia, he got the pneumonia the, again. Yeah, the pneumonia, when, then he had the low, um, the low oxygen saturation, yeah. his uh, oxygen levels were so low, they didn't even understand how he was standing let alone walking into the building. So that's, um, yeah, yeah, bed, bed yeah. sore. Yeah, that's um, deep bed sores. That uh, required surgery, didn't it? In yeah, order to clean it out. Yeah, the abscess All off those of things, bed. any one of those things could have um, been the end of them. They yeah. had to take the, um, the ventilator out because the ventilator, because the COVID damaged his lungs so bad mm -hmm. that the ventilator wasn't doing nothing. So that's yep. why they put the mask over his face. And they said, he is so gasping for air right now, it isn't even funny. Yeah. And they asked me to put him on hospice. And they said, hospice isn't the one, they don't kill you, because there's different levels. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's palliative care. It's they like just keep you comfortable. Levels, but yeah. he was so bad that he couldn't even get in there, in the hospice, because he was so bad. And um, they wouldn't take him. So, they, you know, because he was just, his, the, the doctor said he was cold. Well, whatever yes. you need, don't be afraid to ask. And if some, if one of us uh, can't help, then um, you I know, want my a group of back. us. Well, that's what I need, my husband. That's, I've actually, I mean, that's what I felt for. A long time. That's what my wife and I would pray over and over again yeah. um, in the in the night that we would when, before we went to bed that you know Rosie needs her husband back. We we know that. You know what? If he treated me mean and he was so mean to me, and but he wasn't. He was so good to me, and he gave me anything I wanted. Anything I wanted, I asked him. He said, "You go get it." If he was mean to me and ran to the clubs or something. I probably would have been him up myself. You know? <laughs> but um, <laughs> but <laughs> when he came home, he it, um, he was so George good to me. Nice he guy. never he never went nowhere. He just was always with me. You know, we was always together. Mm -hmm. And and he never cheated on me. He never did anything. I mean, he, you know, we were drinking. We was together. You know, and then we stopped that when we were younger, but um, but then, you know, he, if he was me, I would make him spell Czechoslovakia if he got up to the heaven. I was there. 
I, I heard that joke before. Spells Czechoslovakia. <laughs> yeah. But we don't have time to go into that joke right now. But I'm, so, <laughs> um, I'm glad to see you see you laugh, sister. I know that it's going to be a roller coaster ride for you, though, about being able to reminisce and laugh at one moment and then cry uh, the next. Um, well, I. Just, but that's uh, you know you're being put to the proof now and in the book of James there about. Uh, this saying that, you know, to count it all joy, um, to when we fall into these diverse temptations, and like I said, temptations is a putting to the proof, and, you know, right now, uh, you're going through that, being put to the proof of how you're going to respond to this great loss. I mean, that's the same thing, you know, Job had that loss of uh, his family. I've seen you know, all of his children dying in an instant when the walls of the house collapsed and um you know what what did job do he yes he made accusations about fairness to god like you I know you're not that. you're not being fair but he never he never cursed god and you said yeah. that you know that was one of the things that you just was uh talking to the lord about so as i was saying the bible is clear that we're going to be uh put through the proof for uh, in things in this life but uh as as a quick addition to this lesson it's important to know th- to note um, a part of the Lord's Prayer and also what we already talked about, Romans 8, 28, about putting to the the proof. The Bible um, says about the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 13, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So even though James says that, um, you know, about us, that when we, to to count it all joy, uh, what did you say that was calm? Chris, but to be calmly well when we fall into diverse temptations or when we fall into the different ways of being uh, put to the test, uh, to be calmly well about it, uh, to, to know this, that the trying of our faith works patience, and patience, let it, let it have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, uh, wanting uh, nothing. And in the Lord's Prayer, it says, and lead us not into temptation. Jesus was giving a road map, kind of uh, like, a, like a schematic of how to pray, not just words to say. You know, I know in the church that we like to recite the Lord's Prayer, and that's, that's great for memorization uh, types of things, but actually, you know, the Lord's Prayer was an instruction. It was a schematic on how to pray, and part of that Jesus told um, his uh, disciples, he said, to, when you do pray, to say, and lead us not uh, into temptation, and that's the same word, that pyrasmos, uh, in the Greek, which is in James, when we fall into diverse temptations, it means to put into the proof. So Jesus said for us to pray to the Lord to not be put to the test, to be put to the proof, but deliver us from evil. And, um, you know, to be, extrapolate that out to um, an English uh, translation that would be more, that would click more in our ears and make more sense, Jesus said, and lead us uh, and don't put us to the proof, Lord, but deliver us from the evil one. And we talked earlier about who is the evil one. He is the accuser, Ha Satan, the accuser. So we're supposed to ask God to not let us be put to the proof, but delivered uh, from the evil one. And we we already talked about Romans eight twenty eight, where it says, and we know that even with all of these things that can happen, we know that all things work together for good for everyone. Right. To them that love God, to those who are other called according to his purpose, as Sister Joanne read. We quote that, but do we believe it? And do we actually live it in times of trouble? And Rosie is actually giving us a live demonstration right now that she's trying to live that in this time of trouble of the loss of her husband. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's not by accident that you're here tonight and we're talking about such a serious lesson, Rosie. James said that we're going to be put to the proof, but to be joyful or calmly well, or even, you know, to have a a cheerfulness about it when it happens, and it's hard enough to endure adversities, let alone, you know, have any sort of uh, being okay with it, but again, we have actual biblical examples of just that, and one that actually comes to mind to me is Paul and Silas when they were thrust into the inner prison because of their faith in Jesus, 
And uh, the inner prison is what? That's the filthiest, the deepest part of uh, those dungeon types of prisons at the time. You know, if anybody was uh, on the upper levels going to the bathroom, it's all dripping down and running down to where you were at in the inner prison. So Paul and Silas, because of their faith in Jesus, that's where they were thrust into and they were held fast. I think in the stocks at that time, I don't remember the exact, but they were held fast in the, the stocks in that inner prison. And uh, not only were they being put to the proof for their faith, but they were, they were actually really uh, calmly well to the point that they became cheerful about it enough to sing hymns while they were, they were singing praises unto God. And you can read that for yourself in Acts chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. Now our real enemy, Satan, the accuser, he has it out for us. He has a three-point mission. And his three-point mission is found in John 10.10, 10, and I quote that all the time because it's such an important thing for us to understand, and that John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, <coughs> and to destroy, and Jesus said the other part of that phrase, on when you read it in the King James Version, there's a, a colon there that's separated, so there's a separate phrase. It starts out, the thief comes not but, cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy, and Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, what's an example of uh, stealing, killing, and destroying um, in our lives as Christians? I mean, we have uh, one now with Rosie that's like, you know, top of the list for tonight is that the devil, um, you know, he wants to steal her faith from her. He wants to just kill her outright and to utterly destroy her in hell um, because of this loss of her husband. He wants you to fail. He wants you uh, in the same way that Job was, uh, when he was put to the proof, when he was put to the test, and Satan said that, you know, I can't get to him because you have a hedge around him. You lift that hedge up a little bit and let me slip in there. And not only is he going to turn his back on you, he's going to curse you to your face. That's the same thing that you're going through right now, you know, that's, uh, this is, this is an awful thing, and it, it's, it's hard to comprehend, you know, like, you know, how, how is she holding it together when George has, has passed today, but she's here, uh, with us, and, um, I mean, this, um, I had no idea that you was going to be here, uh, tonight when the, the Lord put this, uh, lesson on my heart, but it's, uh, an example uh, about standing strong in spiritual uh, warfare against the enemy that does want to steal from us, to kill us, and to utterly destroy us. So um, how do we survive things when we are put to the proof? Standing on the strength of the Lord. Anybody else? Brother Elmer? Yeah, when Job saw his family lost. He said this, though God slays me, yet will I trust him. That's yep. how much he had for a love for him, for God himself. Yep. He says, no matter what happens, though I he still trust him. Though he slays me says, in my flesh, I will see yeah, God. I will still trust him. And that's uh, an amazing thing. You know, that's, uh, and when, when you read that, um, the book was written like poetry. That makes it hard enough to understand. And then it's, it's, it's Hebrew pro poetry, he, and then it's translated into English. And so that makes it a little bit more difficult to get like all the little nuggets, details out there. But just reading a, just the, the, uh, like the novel version of it in a very modern English uh, version, it's an incredible story of someone that went through horrific things and, uh, you know, they accused God, he accused God of unfairness and stuff, and his friends accused him, like, you brought this on yourself, and, but Job never cursed God. It says when it, when it happened, you know, Job was the guy that was, uh, he was making sacrifices for his children because he was afraid that they may have sinned, and he wanted them to be right with God, and here he lost all of them, lost all of his wealth, and he was a very... A wealthy man, and uh, there was never an explanation that was given to him as to why, but he never cursed God, and at the end, he prevailed, and things were restored unto him, and uh, me, I wonder, you know, what it was like when Job actually did uh, stand before God, you know, what, how God received him <laughs> into his presence. Yes. 
Um, I don't. I don't know if it details about that or not. I know that he presented sacrifices unto God uh, because he was uh, concerned because his children they would go from house to house, you know, feasting. They were a wealthy family. And the brothers would invite the sisters over. And when they were all gathered together in one of the, the houses of the brothers there, then uh, there was a, uh, just a tornado, I think. Like, and that just, it brought the house down and killed them all. And then, you know, all of his livestock was gone after that. And then, you know, he goes on and loses his health and became estranged from his wife for that time. And, but I don't know if it specifically uh, talks about an altar. I don't, I don't remember, but possibly, you know. So, um, so how do we survive when we are put to the proof? You know, we survive. What we do is we survive the down and dirty in the trenches kind of warfare, the same as um, those uh, Tier 1 operators and the astronauts of Apollo 13 did. I know in the first part, of the lesson, we, I was making reference about work the problem, and that goes back to Gene Kranz uh, from NASA, and that was uh, his saying, and then, you know, it made it into popular culture, and then it was on that TV show about those uh, Navy SEALs. So when we get into this kind of warfare, we do it, this, we survive doing the same things that they did, what the, uh, the Apollo astronauts did, what real uh, Navy SEAL operators do and other uh, type of professional operators do, how, what they do to survive. And there's two things that uh, you need for, to be able to survive in situations that are real down in the trenches, dirty warfare, uh, where the devil is coming against you in a horrible way, like this example with what Rosie's going through. Number one is to rely on your training. That's the number one thing if you become a professional in something and you get yourself into a situation that you need to get yourself out of is that they say rely your, your people that teach you they tell you rely on your training rely on your training just fall back on your training there's a reason that you were trained in this way in the first place is because it works we don't teach you stuff that's not going to work because we want you to survive. We want you to come back. We want you to make it through. And this, the same thing applies in spiritual warfare when you're being trained in the Word of God in the church that you happen to find yourself in if they are training you in the Word of God. And number two is to be part of a team that has your back. Now, relying on your training, what's our training? We already went over Romans 8.28, but how about a few more? Part of our training is to know that through all of these situations, that all things work together for good to them, to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, right? So, but there's a few more, and we can't possibly, in the hour and a half that we had, and we're down to really 15 minutes before we're supposed to end, to go over every scripture that should be part of our warfare training. But one of them, uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Your training, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Sister, uh, Dr. Nelson, you raised your hand. Oh, I thought you was... Uh, <laughs> Right on, brother. <laughs> That's what I'm trusting the Lord with all your heart. Um, and then there's, um, there's another one. You know, this is taken from a more obscure area, Leviticus chapter 8, or chapter 26, verses 8 and 9. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword, for I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you, God, in the Old Testament. Uh, and so the training is that when we're together as a group, the, the, the authority, the power that we have as a group, the five of you shall chase a hundred, a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, what's it say? Uh, wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, Jesus' name, that there he is in the midst of us. Um, and then also we have, uh, we have training uh, in the Bible that talks about us taking up uh, our spiritual armor, Paul the Apostle was using the example of the, the armor that the Roman soldiers and maybe the temple guards, uh, maybe it was a mix or one or the other that they wore. He said, finally, my brethren, giving instructions to the believers there at the churches in Ephesus, Paul the Apostle says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the trickery of the devil. He said, for we wrestle not, we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Paul says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day when it comes on us. And having done all to stand, fall down and die. No, he says, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, above all these other things, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword is the only offensive weapon there that can be used for defense and for offense. And what's to say about the, the word of God? It says the word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the decide, dividing asunder soul and spirit, spirit and joints and marrow, you know, just you know, split you wide open, fillet you right out there. And as it's a revealer, it reveals the thoughts and intents of our heart. And um, and Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication, prayers for all saints. That's uh, that's training. You know, taking under the taking unto us the full armor of God, and then uh, you know how to apply these things ourselves to take the time to learn what Ephesians chapter six. Is That's another example of biblical training for us to be able to withstand when we are being put to the proof. Now, can uh, anyone think of something else, another thing that we as believers in Christ uh, have learned in our spiritual warfare training? Is there, is there one... Um, is there one more maybe? or there, there, I mean, they're all throughout the Bible. We just don't have time to cover them all. Is there somebody can think of something else that has to do with training that we would receive in order for us to be able to be true um, warriors in this spiritual warfare that we fight every day against the accuser? Somebody give me a bottle of water, please. Weapons of our warfare, spiritual training that gives us strength, defense. What's that? Pray, praise. I thought you said praying. Praise. Praise of God. And singing. Praise and singing. singing yep, Paul and Silas used that when they was in, thank you, when they were in prison. I, I get dried out. <laughs> keep doing that. Keep praying, keep praising. How about the one about spiritual warfare itself? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 that uh, you know that gives us uh, training to understand about spiritual warfare itself that you know even though we're walking in these fleshly bodies our fight in this world it's not against other human beings it's not against the natural forces it's not against the animals of the world we were instructed to take dominion here that's what we were instructed to do to take dominion and then to manage things here but to do it in a godly way and when Cain slew Abel, what did he say? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yeah, you actually, actually are, but you ended up killing him. Sister, what was you going to say? Romans 12, I like. Yep, I'm actually coming up on that one here real soon. <laughs> Romans 12. But the spiritual warfare itself, that we don't fight in our flesh against things, but the real warfare is a spiritual warfare against these principalities, these wicked things, this, this, this accuser, this uh, Hasatan, the accuser, the devil, as he accuses us. The devil is what? He's the accuser of the brethren. And we're supposed to not war again in the flesh, but the weapons that we do have, they're not fleshly weapons, but they are mighty. They are mighty through God to the pulling. They pull down strongholds. They cast down imaginations. And every high thing that tries to bring itself up against the knowledge of God, and it's 
and our weapons bring into captivity every thought, every thought that we have to the obedience of Christ. Now, trained operators, going back to the beginning, talking about that, you know, Navy SEAL TV show and also the astronauts, how about surgeons? And pretty much every uh, person who has had professional training works the problems they face in life and in work, which, by the way, is part of life itself. Now, how do they work the problems? How do they actually get down to actually working the problems? They rely on their training. And you will hear that over and over again in any skilled profession that requires specialized training. What makes these men and, <coughs> excuse me, women professional is the training that they put into operation and by utilizing the specialized skills that they have that they've mastered. They actually utilize these skills that they've learned over time. They put them into operation and that's what makes them professionals. That's what makes them, uh, you know, go, going above and beyond what we can do with the basics of things. Like uh, if somebody, um, you know, somebody has a, a bleed in, in their brain and a surgeon says that, you know, they need an operation to, to seal off that, that bleed, you know. I, I don't want somebody with just basic knowledge, you know, trying to take care of that situation, especially if it was me. You want your nurse practitioner in there. No, I don't. <laughs> Nurse practitioners are professionals. They're professionals, but you got to stay in your lane. You know, we, we all got to stay in our lane, right? So that's, they haven't had that level of specialized training to be a neurosurgeon. And then, you know, of course, we even know, like in the flesh, you know, even a neurosurgeon can make mistakes, but that's, um, you know, when, if, when you need the work done, we want somebody that knows what they're doing to be getting in there rooting around in your brain to be sealing off a bleed. You know, that's the specialized training is what makes the neurosurgeon the professional in the first place because they've mastered certain skills and they use it for the, the saving of lives. And so it's the same for us as followers of Christ when we're working the problems of spiritual warfare that in our lives. But and uh, so how many of us have actually had like uh, little or big dreams <coughs> excuse me, of becoming, um, what time is it, 7.54, great, <laughs> uh, becoming a professional uh, such as an athlete or a musician, singer, dancer, artist, or something else that requires specialized or specific uh, skill set training uh, that, you know, where we have to be trained way above um, the basics. Anybody ever had dreams like that, becoming a professional athlete or something like that? No? Professional singer, musician? Professional hunter? Well, you did go to school for that, so <laughs> so that's a professional teacher. Well, we, we admire those kind of jobs in, in life um, because uh, of the, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of fame and money that's uh, associated with jobs like that, but we often fail to think what actually has to go in to those jobs to be trained at that level to be like world leaders in, uh, in those types of jobs. When I was a teenage boy, one of the popular things was to uh, imagine oneself as a lead guitarist uh, in a, like one of the major rock bands or being one of the top athletes of a sports team. I mean, that's what teenagers did. However, I can't think of any person that I knew back then as a teenager uh, in the old neighborhood that actually achieved e any, any one of those things because it actually is uh, a, a rare thing. Uh, there's a meme that's on um, the internet that says that like, you know, 99 percent of uh, your children uh, uh, will not become a professional athlete, you know, only one percent of them will, but uh, 100 percent of your children will stand before God one day, so, you know, take the time to teach them about the Lord, then, you know, let them be so focused on these other things that can distract them, but anyway, um, for these uh, big dreams or little dreams that people have had, it doesn't mean that even though they're rare, that they're, they were totally unattainable. It just means that even though things like uh, the high-level achievement in sports and music, they're, they're kind of stands out, standouts because of the fame and fortune that's associated with them. Uh, but, you know, we typically, um, even though it's like, oh, that would be cool to, you know, have that kind of money, that kind of recognition, to, you know, be like a, a, like a world-class musician or a world-class athlete. But how many of us actually wanted to take time to put in the committed effort uh, to get to that skill level? You know, it's, it's very rare 
that people reach that level because there's only, you know, a, a special few that actually commit themselves to work the problem as they move along the way to put in all the grunt work and all the effort to get there. And uh, that's, um, you know, most people don't want to put in that type of work. So those of us that, uh, as human beings, that do achieve what we call greatness in any pursuit are really good at working the problems, no matter what they are. Uh, in public performance types of things, such as being a rock star or a football great or something like that, we, we're actually, when we're watching them, we see, we're seeing the results of the blood, sweat, and tears that they put in over a long period of time to get that good. And if you want to excel in your service to Jesus Christ, your King, you will put in the effort to be the spiritual warfare fighter that he wants you to be. And if you read in the book of uh, Hebrews, you know, there was uh, two sides of that coin, as I mentioned earlier. You know, some people, some of them receive like they're the dead raised to life. But then you look and, like some of them, you know, for a greater glory, they, they went on to become martyrs. They were, they were sawn asunder. So, you know, as can any one of our lives in here uh, go in that direction? where uh, we, you know, we face some sort of martyrdom or something like that? Absolutely, that's a possibility. Uh, but you know, the, the great number of us, we live average lives, and then we, we die, and then we go stand before the Lord. God has in mind for us, for us to be uh, the spiritual warfare fighter that he wants us to be as individuals. So it's important for us to be sensitive to know what that truly is, but to... Uh, you're not going to know anything unless you're putting in the effort and making the commitment to know, um, to become equipped to be a spiritual warfare fighter in the first place. Paul, as he said, he wants all of us, and he says, I beseech you, therefore, this is Romans 12, 1 and 2. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Based on what Jesus has done for us on the cross, it's our reasonable service because of his sacrifice to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what that is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We're supposed to put in the effort in order for us to uh, become what God wants us to be as individuals. And um, we're... We need to get the spiritual training that we need and to take the time, like I said earlier, um, you know, we want to enjoy all the good things of God. But like I used that example about the fellow that was teaching some uh, complicated concepts and he said, uh, you know, <clears throat> sometimes, uh, you know, you got to eat the broccoli. Remember that? He said, my mom would serve these vegetables on the plate. We had to eat our vegetables and there was some good stuff on the plate. So, but I had to get you know, for me, he said, I had to get through the broccoli first so I can enjoy the good stuff. He says, so the broccoli wasn't fun, but, you know, I got it off the plate first, I ate it, and then I enjoyed the other stuff. You know, for us, a lot of times, what we want to do is, you know, we want all the good stuff, but we don't want to eat the broccoli. I know some of us like broccoli, so it's just an analogy, you know, just, just an example, a metaphor, if you will. That's, uh, so sometimes we got to, you know, we have to get down to the basics and eat the broccoli. I found out from the kids, some of them, and they may not be kids that go to this church, but um, I found out that there's some kids that aren't praying like they should be praying. I found out that there's some that aren't reading their Bible like they should be reading it. But then they may be facing a situation that requires them to be equipped in spiritual war fighting and not know what to do. And it may cause them to fail. Now, I said kids because they were telling me, which is an honorable thing. You know, they were actually sharing that with me. Now, I can't speak for the adults in the room because nobody's told me anything that, hey, brother, I'm not praying like I should. Hey, brother, I'm not in the word like I should. I'm, I'm not doing this like I should. I'm not following the Lord's direction this way like I should. So I just used the example of the kids because they were, you know, they, they shared that with me. So my instruction to them is if um, you want to, yeah, I called you out. And I didn't even say, I said it could be kids from another church, but you just let it out there, brother. <laughs> kids from another church. That other church where I'm the assistant pastor, those other kids, those, those, 
those bad kids. <laughs> no, we got good kids here, but they got to commit themselves to, you know, eat the broccoli and, you know, not leave that on the plate and just try to enjoy the good things of the Lord. You got to put the time in. If you want to be able to work the problem, you got to get the training in you to be able to work the problem. That, in that example of that TV show, the tier one operator, he, when his friend told him, work the problem, Ray, when Gene Kranz told the people in, at NASA in the, in the flight room, the flight control room, and then also the, the astronauts that was in um, the Apollo 13, on the Apollo 13 mission, when he said work the problem, you know, they relied on their training, what they knew, what they spent years learning, what they applied themselves to in order to get the answers that they needed to bring that crew home safely. And in that fictitious show for that guy that was fall, free falling at 126 miles per hour from like 36,000 feet up for him to be cut his lines free from that chute that failed to deploy correctly and deploy his uh, reserve chute so he didn't hit the ground and splatter like a grape uh, under a concrete block. Sister. I think we're saying just go back to the basics. Back to the basics. Baseball players tell people that too. Yep. Yeah, you can't build on something until you actually get the fundamentals first. That's There's a verse that I really like, and it comes out of Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only with their eyes or is when their eyes are on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence yep. for the Lord. And whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. And I, that, I think, has a lot to say in our lifestyle and everything that we try to do. We're not doing it in front of people. We're doing it in front of him. That, uh, that is an issue at times that some people, they want to impress you um, because they have a desire to impress men, you know, those that might be their peers or even especially often uh, superiors, and they want to do that to, be, uh, to impress them. You don't have to, like, for, for me and the kids, you don't have to impress me. You know, if you want to, if you want to impress someone, Im impress the God that you're serving. Uh, sister, microphone. Yeah, I, um, it, it, this is for everybody, but I want to speak to the uh, young adults there. Um, Shout was phenomenal for you guys. And when you came back, it was phenomenal for us. Okay, but you can't live on that experience. Right. Okay. In the Bible, it says you are going to have problems in this world. So in this world, you'll have trouble. Yeah, you'll have trouble. You'll have problems. However, you whatever word you want to use, it's it's you're going to have trouble, <laughs> bad stuff going on in your life. But that experience that you all went through is to carry you through the troubled times. So mm -hmm. I hope that all of us should be listening. But my heart right now is for the young adults. Yeah, it was part of their training. Yeah, yeah. it's part of your training. And it's training for us adults. I mean, mm -hmm. we haven't arrived neither in a lot of things, especially like oh, no, we when troubles continue. come into our lives, the, it always seems like it, it, ups the, it ups the ante on, mm -hmm. on it, so to speak. But you have to prepare yourself. You can't live just by the experience. Okay, you remember what God did for you at Shout. You remember how awesome he was. You remember how he blessed you. You remember you're, he's building your faith with all of that. And um, there was something else I wanted to say. And I, but you have to. You have to be in your Bible every day. Every day. You have to. Be, I, and again, I don't care if you're reading it just for five minutes. At least you're reading. You're equipping yourself with something. Okay, you're with his word, what you need to fight these battles. Okay, but if you don't read, if you don't do devotions, if you're not praying, then you leave yourself wide open for the devil to just throw them arrows at you. Okay, yep. we could do all the praying we want. Okay, but you have to equip yourself. All right, and prayer works. Don't get me wrong on, on that. 
all right, but you, it, you're becoming, you're accountable for yourself now, okay? So you have to start e learning how to equip yourself, putting on the full armor of God every single day in that training. So when the battle does come, you're going to know how to fight. You're not going to cave in, okay? You know, Pastor oh. Deacon Joe. <laughs> I, I listened to a guy today who he went, as soon as he graduated high school, he went to overseas, and he had nine months to spend overseas. And in that nine months, he read the Bible five times. And he said the reason why he did it, because he knew when he came back home that life was going to take over, that he was going to have to have a job, that he was going to get married, that he was going to have children, and he wasn't going to have that same empty time that he had at that moment, and he wanted to make sure he prepared himself for having a job, for having a wife, for having children. So you take the opportunity. And, it, you know, it, it, as more life piles upon you, the harder it is to, to make that time. I mean, I mean, you have to make that time. There's no excuse not to make that time. But life does pile upon you, and then you try, you're trying to figure it out. So why you guys are, do have idle time? Make sure you're there. Yeah, it's a matter of setting priorities because life uh, goes by real fast. You know, right now you're 18. Pretty soon you'll be 60. And then wonder, like, where did the time go? In just a few days. But uh, <clears throat> going back this to... This fellow what, over here? Well, yeah. Going back to what Chris was saying about uh, shout, I came to realize this a little bit before we went. And by saying this, I'm not trying to discount the validity of the experiences that we had there at all, because I'm really thankful that we were able to go. But a, a lot of events like Shout and Winterfest are heavily, uh, I don't want to say driven by emotion, but they're really emotionally involved. And when you come back yeah. for weeks, you are on that high, but within a few weeks that begins to falter and you seem to fall back. And <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm any different than anybody, but one of my, one of the hallmarks of being me is that I just don't show emotion. Like, oh, I hit the lottery, okay. Like, oh, got in the car wreck, okay. Like, when, when that van rolled over in front of me, I was just like, oh. That happened. And then, like, that night, I was like, oh, that happened. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not really sure where I'm going at this point, but I feel like events like that are necessary, but we can't solely rely on that. No, you can't. To get where we need to be. We can use that as a jump start, but that can't carry us. Right. All the way through. That's a good way to look at it. It is a, you know, like a revival type atmosphere to, you know, revive you, but it's supposed to drive you into um, a deeper relationship with the Lord. And a deeper relationship with the Lord is a commitment for you to do what it takes to get to know Him and, um, you know, not be looking for a, a new word from the Lord, but to get to know uh, the word of the Lord as it's already been written to you to get to know the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, so, um, in case anybody's wondering, that little red lozenge that I grabbed was cinnamon, so that's not really <laughs> helping my throat to the degree <laughs> that I thought it was going to. I thought it was cherry. I was like, oh, wow, well, that's, that's cinnamon. I don't really want to be spitting that out, so now I'm really hitting the water. If I may have just... Um, I'll just like read through this real quick. It's part, it's number two, be part of a team that has your back. Uh, you know, number one is to, you know, know your training, to rely on it. And number two, be part of a team that has your back. If uh, you're going to be able to work problems effectively as far as spiritual warfare is concerned. And in Philippians chapter two, uh, verses two through four, Paul says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. 
I should uh, esteem Joe uh, better than myself. And uh, it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that uh, basically is to be busy about somebody else's business, but in a good way, not in a way to like, so you can have something to gossip about them. But when you see someone uh, that's going through something to, to be there, to do something to help them. Prime example, what Rosie's going through now. So we're supposed to, you know, to make that attempt to be actively involved in her life in order to help her through situations. And that's when you see somebody uh, struggling, you do what you can uh, to help them, you know, to be part of a team that has your back. If we're believers in Christ and we're not going to be there for one another, this doesn't, this doesn't work, you know, as part, being part of the body of Christ. You know, as we know that uh, you know, the, the Bible says that the, foot can't, uh, the hand can't say to the foot, like, I don't have any need of you, uh, as far as individual members of the body of Christ here on earth, which is us, the believers. Uh, but also, you know, we're supposed to show concern for one another. Like, um, we're supposed to care for one another, just like, you know, we care for our own bodies, you know. If, uh, you know, if my, if, my, if my ankle is hurting down by my foot, I might need to rub my ankle and massage my ankle to work uh, the, you know, work the arthritis a little bit out of there in order to be soothing. You know, we got to reach out and be a help one to another. And uh, also, uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 11, um, it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. That's uh, in, uh, in the ext- easy-to-read version. It says, so encourage each other and help each other uh, grow stronger in faith, just as you are already doing, Paul said. And um, this, that word edify, it's uh, one of those... Um, Greek words that has several syllables. It's uh, oikadamayo, oikadameo rather, oikadameo. Sorry, oikadameo. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, uh, that's play that back on live stream for me, and make that your ringtone there. But what does it mean? Edify. It means to be a house builder, and that is to be like a, a construction in order to build up, to embolden. We're supposed to edify one another, to build one another up. And each of us uh, can take on the task as different parts of the building crew when it comes to building each other up. Just like, you know, we, we, we mentioned the youth because they are uh, often open in order to share with us things. Like, you know, adults don't come up to me and say, hey, haven't been reading my Bible and praying like I should. But, you know, in conversation, the youth might... You know, they'll bring that up to me. They're more, they're more open. And so we talk about the youth, about building them up, you know, training them, building them up in the Lord. And each one of us might have different construction capabilities when it comes to edifying, to building up one another. You know, when you go in to build a house, somebody has to actually dig out around the trench in order that the footer can be laid. And then somebody puts the foundation on the footer. You know, the foundation that we have is Christ, right? And then the builders on top of that, somebody got to come in. Uh, we had the framing tr- crew come in, and they frame up the house. And then you have the roofing crew come in, and they put the shingles and everything on. And you have people to come in and put the siding. And then so the outer sheath of, this house, of the house is done. Somebody comes in and puts in windows. Somebody else comes in. you got plumbers. You got electricians, HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning people come in and run all the ductwork, the wires, the plumbing, the sewer lines. And then somebody puts in insulation. And then finish crews comes in and they put up all the drywall and stuff like that. And they'll hang the fixtures and uh, stuff like where the, the, the light lights are supposed to go in the ceiling fans and things like that and then usually a lot of times there's a separate trim crew that comes out and they'll trim out the house put all the trim the baseboard trim uh, cove moldings and stuff like that that you have throughout the house and then there uh, there'll be painting and then there'll be the carpeting uh, hardwood flooring stuff like that and then finally the somebody comes in somebody comes in and it might be a crew to put in like the final touches of decoration on the house and then you have landscapers working the outside around the house there's different construction ex- experts that come in to build the house. 
And each one of us has skills that are given to us by the Lord in order for us to be able to edify one another. Someone may be good at uh, being able to uh, just come up with the scriptures you need right now in your life in order to show you something that's in the Word of God that applies directly to your life, something that you can use right now that will edify you, that will build you up. Somebody else might be great at praying in order to be effectually fervent in prayer in order to lift someone out up out of the mire that they're in because of the prayers that they're they're saying. Somebody else might be gifted operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit through prophecy, through uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, things like that. Somebody else might just be a help somebody that has a ministry of helps, and whatever it may be, we all work together in order to edify, to lift one another up. So it's important to be part of a team that has your back. And um, what kind of warfare team are you a part of? And take note that not everyone, everybody in church is even a warrior. You know, not everybody that warms a pew is actually uh, in, that is, they're not actually, may not actually be a spiritual warrior. They may not know, have a clue about what spiritual warfare actually is. And so as for those who are on your team of spiritual warfare operators, uh, which ones actually have your back? Who are they? And you probably have a list who you already know. And in that fictional story about uh, Tier 1 Navy SEAL operator Ray, who was tangled in his shoot lines, his friend was telling him to work the problem, Ray. That was a reminder to him that in this life or death situation, while Ray was falling from the sky from 36,000 feet at 126 miles per hour, was seconds until impact with the ground that Ray needed to use what he already knew to work the problem of the moment if he wanted to survive. And then I had examples about Hezekiah in the spiritual warfare that he went through, how he was a king that the Lord said uh, did right in his eyes, and that he cleansed the temple, he restored the temple worship, brought back the celebration of Passover because not many people were doing it or doing it right. He organized the priests, he destroyed a bunch of idols and people set up uh, that people set up to worship instead of the Lord their God. And Hezekiah, he began to reign when he was 25 years old. He started this. And even though old Hezi's dad was Ahaz, and Ahaz was a bad king, he didn't follow in his father's footsteps. He was one of the very few kings that actually did what God said was right. So it was probably Hezi, Hezekiah's mom, that must have taught him about God, taught him how that what it meant to serve God and what the God of the Bible says about things. And we know that there's a verse that says that in Proverbs 22, 6, 22 verse 6, that train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And Hezekiah, when it came, you know, he had... He, he was doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, restored the temple worship, cleansed the temple, had things going back the way they, you know, wiping out idols and stuff like that, doing what he could in the Lord's service. And then Hezekiah got to a place that he had to work a problem. And that's when Sennacherib come along, the king of Assyria, uh, and, you know, sent his representatives and said, hey, you know, you know, we're coming in, we're, we're, we're taking you out, and that's just the, that's just the way it is. And there's nothing you can do about it. Your God's not going to be able to do anything. And here they were speaking to the people. You know, Hezekiah come in and he destroyed all your gods that you had built up everywhere. Now what are you going to do? No one's going to be there to rescue you. But that's um, you know, one thing that the, the Jews actually did know was that, you know, it was the Lord, their God, that was God. Even though there was a lot of idol worship, uh, there was still a memory of where they came from. And so... Um, when Sennacherib come along and told them that uh, you know this you know this is it we're you know we're gonna we're gonna take you out. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to stop us. And if you want to continue, uh, you know, laid up there in behind your walls while we put this siege against you, you know, you're gonna be eating your own dung and drinking your own urine. That's what it's gonna be like. And Hezekiah is gonna be the one to do this to you. But what happened? Hezekiah he worked the problem. He took the letters that was given to him, you know, just saying, you know, like this, this is what Sennacherib was laying out, what was going to happen to them, and all the accusations and stuff. And he laid it there at the altar of the Lord. He went into the house of God. He laid it out there. And he says, look, Lord, look how they mock you. Look at what they're saying to you. 
And then he was working the problem based on what he knew, based on how he was trained, whether it was his mom, his grandma, whoever taught him the ways of the Lord, they taught him well. And yes, Hezekiah did make mistakes in his life, but they taught him well, and he worked the problem. He trusted in the Lord with all of his heart, did not lean unto his own understanding. In his, in his ways, Hezekiah acknowledged God, and God directed his path. And then what did God do? He sent an angel, wiped out 180,000 Assyrians in, uh, Assyrians in one night. One angel, one night. God, Hezekiah worked the problem, doing what he knew to do based on his training, and God gave him the result that he needed. And then there's other things there, like, you know, when Hezekiah, there's so many, there's... Um, the examples of Daniel, there's examples of Gideon, you know, going from 30,000, I think, men down to 300, but they had to work the problem. God told them to go out there, be right up there in the presence of the enemy, right there surrounding them in their encampment with 300 men, you know, and all I want you to do is have some trumpets in one hand and have lights in the other hand covered by a pitcher so no one can see the light, and then when it comes time, Gideon said, you know, you break the pitcher, you, you know, you blow the horn, and you say the sword of the Lord and Gideon. Well, how's that going to win us against, you know, these tens of thousands of people that we're coming up with that want to kill us? And then, but God said, do it that way. You know, they were working the problem according to the way God told them to work it, and then it worked out. You work the problem the way God wants you to work the problem, and it will work out for you. Even in the darkest times, when we don't have an answer, when we don't have an explanation, when we don't, like with Job, when he didn't, Job didn't see behind uh, the scenes of what was going on. He didn't have that perspective that we have looking over, seeing that we have Job on this side, we have the accuser there, and we have God here answering the accuser, have you considered my servant Job? Job didn't see that spiritual side of things. And in our own lives, a lot of times, we don't see the reason why we're going through certain things, the spiritual significance of, of it, and then if we try to fight this battle in, uh, in, of our own accord, in our own flesh, we will fail. But if we fight the spiritual battle using the spiritual weapons according to the training that we have received uh, in, our, in, our, in Christ, then we work the problem and we're going to win. Camera two is about to die, so... <laughs> About to die. That's uh, David. David's English. So we've got to, well, um, before we go offline here, um, okay, uh, John Santo praying for health. Uh, he now has skin cancer. Vanessa Ciccarelli, pray for her son Mark for safe travels to and from work. Uh, Ella McCourt, friend of hers, uh, Janetta is battling cancer for the second time. Uh, she is way too young, and Ella says, I believe in miracles. I do too. Vanessa has a urinary tract infection that is very painful, and Vanessa also is asking that we pray for Chick. Uh, the move is very hard on him, and I can imagine that it truly is. And uh, Okay, Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord. I thank you. You have a prayer request? Okay. David Roberts? Oh, okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had, um, had that work accident and fingers were cut off. They're going to take him if the feeling doesn't return. Okay. Elmer? Yeah. 
All right. Joe? Say again? Oh. He was killed in a quad accident today, your cousin? Hmm. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, he's a barber and had severe burns. And they did have skin graft. Okay. Where's, uh, where did your cousin live at that was lost? Tennessee. Anyone else? Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. Lord, I just got things running through my head right now, and I know I went over the time, and I get a sense that I should be in a, a hurry so folks can get out at the time that they expect to get out, but I'm going to stop right there and just, um, I'm going to honor this moment with you, Lord. I'm not going to just say a prayer for saying a prayer in order to fulfill like a ritual that we just say a prayer every Wednesday evening before the live stream ends. Lord, I know people are facing life or death situations or facing um, serious health situations. Uh, they're facing serious changes in their lives. Rosie is facing the loss of her husband, and she's here with us today. Father, first off, as Blainsburg Bible Church, you know, it's, it's, it's not the membership role. It's those of us who gather together in your name as this group, whether we're gathered together right here in physical proximity to one another or whether watching by live stream, those who have connected with this local body of Christ here where this is um, like church home to them. Lord, we're gathered together in your name tonight, Lord. First off, Lord, we offer praise, honor, and glory to you, Lord Jesus. And thanks, Lord, for everything that you've done for us. Father, I ask, Lord, that you forgive us, Lord, for our shortcomings, where we fall short, where we miss the mark, Lord. That's what, that's what sin actually is, is missing the mark, that hamorteo, hamortano, that's in the Greek there, missing the mark. We miss the bullseye. That's what, what it is. And we, we miss the mark a lot of times, Lord, sometimes several times a day. And Lord, I'm asking, Lord, that, just, um, that you will forgive me, Lord, for any point where I've missed the mark. Lord, I pray, Lord, that for all of us, Lord, that you forgive each and every one of us, Lord, for any point along the way this day or before where we've missed the mark, Lord. We, we don't want to live our lives like that. We want to live our lives, Lord, in service to you, Lord, to be the example that you want us to be, to carry out the Great Commission as you've instructed us. Lord, do we want to become everything that we can be in you, Lord? And Lord, just remember, Lord, just like it says in your word, to be mindful that we're just dust. And without you, we can do nothing. But the word also says that with God, all things are possible. So Lord, we invite you and your presence into our lives in a mighty, strong way that the Shekinah glory of you, your direct manifest presence, Lord, would shine through us, Lord, in this dark and dim world so that we can truly be the last beacon of light and hope, Lord, to those who are just um, 
They're just on an accelerated path to hell, Lord. Help us, Lord, to divert that path and turn their hearts to you, Lord, to do what we can to point them in the direction of you, Jesus, Lord. Father, tonight, Lord, we have requests like we have uh, every week, Lord. Sister Rosie asked for prayer for David Roberts, who lost his fingers due to an accident at work. And if he doesn't regain the feeling in the fingers that are left on that hand, he's going to lose those ones. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will restore those that hands to that, that the nerve operation and the circulation with what he has remaining is normal so he doesn't lose any more fingers. And for Joe's um, relative there, or soon to be relative, Sam, he's a barber and he's the fiance of uh, June's uh, sister's daughter. That's. Um, Sam's a barber and was severely burned in his hands. Two hand accidents here. And uh, he has to work, he has to use his hands definitely in his line of work. And without that, he would not be able to continue in his livelihood. So, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you restore full movement, nerve conduction, and circulation in his hands and just make the skin pristine and new like it never happened. Father, I ask, Lord, that you will just do this, Lord, for, for Sam, Lord, that you restore him in this way, Lord. And I'll just, I'll believe, Lord, that Sam will give you the honor and glory for it. Father, I thank you, Lord, that um, we can come to you with the family, for the family that remains, even though this one was lost in this awful accident today on that quad where he erected and he hit his head and died. Father, for the family, Lord, or we reject anything that the devil would try to bring against them, and I pray, Lord, that this family just turns everything over to you and that they give you honor and glory and that the devil gets nothing out of this. That everything that he would try to accomplish in stealing, killing, and destroying, that everything is just quashed with him. We rebuke him and bind him off of this family. Lord, help them through this time of grief. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will just give a special blessing of peace upon our sister Rosie, Lord, during this time, that she will have peace, Lord, in the night when she's asleep in her home, knowing that you are there with her, that you will never ever, ever leave her nor forsake her, Lord, that you've equipped her, Lord, to survive. No, you've not only equipped her to survive, you've equipped her to thrive. Lord, I don't know the reason why you had to take George at this time, Lord, but I know that Rosie is alive and remains, Lord, and she has a work to continue to do. And right now, Lord, she is being put to the proof and Lord, do we, we reject the accuser that would be coming against her, railing accusations, trying to throw this against her to get her to turn her back on you, Lord. And she's already spoken what Job has spoken, saying that it's not fair, Lord. And that, that's how we look at things from our perspective, because in our limited understanding, that's all we can understand, that sometimes in this life it does not seem fair. But Lord, your hand is still on Rosie. You still love Rosie. You still have a future in plan for her here, Lord, and you have an eternal future planned for her that she will be able to go to the same place where she knows that her husband George is at. Father, I ask, Lord, that um, you will just bless every one of these prayer requests, that you will heal Sister Vanessa of that UTI infection. And that you will just help Chick, Lord, during this move. It's very hard on him. He's not getting any younger, and he still has to work, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will make a way, Lord, that this move is easy for them and that they don't come against any more uh, financial pressures of uh, things being broken or needing to be upgraded or changed in their new house and that they'll be able to, <coughs> excuse me, afford any change that needs to be made. I thank you, Lord, for Janetta. I don't know who she is. And she's facing cancer for the second time. And uh, Ella says that she's way too young. And Ella says, I believe in miracles. I believe in them too. Father, I'm asking, Lord, for a healing of this cancer in Janetta, whatever it is, Lord, that she will just, just completely obliterate it from her body and raise her up, Lord, just in complete healing. And Lord, I do pray for Mark, Lord, that you will give him traveling mercy to and from work. But not only that, but that you will call him Call him to whatever degree is necessary, Lord, for him to finally get to the place where he submits to you, Lord. I can picture him just dropping to his knees and submitting things to you. And I don't know if he wants to go, if he's going to have to go the hard way or the easy way, but whatever the way is necessary, Lord, 
we know that he needs to be saved, that Brittany needs to be saved, that Amanda needs to be saved, that Jason needs to be saved, that Chick needs to submit himself unto you. Vanessa wants to see her family all saved and serving you. I pray, Lord, that you will grant her this request, Lord. Father, Lord, we rebuke the devil that's just putting lies into their life, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will take the blinders off of them and open them up to the truth of what things are really going on in their lives, how the devil is trying to trick them into an eternal hell. Lord, we just reject that and rebuke it. Lord, we pray, Lord, that through your spirit, speaking through Vanessa and others, Lord, that witness the gospel to them, Lord, that they will open up and just bow the knee to you, Lord, and receive you as your Lord, as their Lord and Savior. Father, I pray, Lord, for uh, the skin cancer in John Santo, Lord, that what whatever was the cause of this, it doesn't matter, Lord. I'm just asking, Lord, just for a, a complete eradication of this skin cancer like it was never there in the first place. Father, I ask, Lord, that you will bless the food that was prepared for us tonight and that you will bless our time of fellowship, Lord, and increase us, Lord, in uh, our spiritual warfare training, Lord. Help us, Lord, to receive and be committed to the training that we need to receive in order to be able to work the problems that we face in our daily lives, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be part of a team that has e that we have each other's back, Lord, to be committed to that, Lord, especially now as we see this day approaching, Lord. This is an evil day, and it's not getting any better. I don't expect it to get any better, so we have to draw closer together as the family of God, as the body of Christ here on earth, Lord, until you call us home, Lord. Strengthen us to do the work that's ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. I ask that um, you will take your spiritual warfare training seriously, that you will commit to it, that you will do above and beyond what your call of duty actually is, and that you will get into the fray there, into the trenches, and serving in the body of Christ, uh, doing the work that God has called you to do. And if you want to support the work that we're doing here at Blainsburg Bible Church, just go to www.blainsburgbiblechurch.org. There's an opportunity to give there. And um, it's, uh, I know that you know prices are going up, gas prices are going up, and everybody's feeling the pinch, but it's, it's the same way all the way around. So whatever the Lord puts on your heart, uh, just do what he asks you to do. That's all, that's all I'm asking. Just do what the Lord asks you to do. And then we, uh, through prayer and out of uh, the necessities that we face here, we apply the things according as God leads us to do. And then the work continues. If you um, are a part of this work and you want to support this work, then you can do it in that manner. Thank you so much for always joining us and for praying with us and praying for us. And I hope that you have just a, a wonderful night.